expected and unexpected. As her jubilee year progressed, planning became more overt, logistics rehearsed and uniforms refreshed. When the news broke, it was covered extensively in the media, but officially the demise of the crown and the accession of the king were proclaimed first at St James's Palace and then later to the people of Scotland from the Market Cross in Edinburgh. As the Scotsman reported the following day, owing to the long reign of the Queen, there were not, one may be sure, many in the crowd who could recall the ceremonial when Her Majesty entered upon the occupancy of her throne. The ceremony of yesterday was therefore for this generation unique in its character and occasioned a great amount of interest in the minds of the citizens and the residents of the capital. With all eyes turned on the cross, the Lord Provost stepped to the front and in a clear voice called on the Lion King to proceed with the royal proclamation. A flourish of silver trumpets having secured attention, the Lion King read the following proclamation. Whereas it has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late Sovereign Lady Queen Victoria, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the imperial crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the high and mighty Prince Albert Edward. In coming to this talk this evening, it struck me that there was an obvious beginning and an equally obvious end to a review of the evolution of state ceremonial in Scotland and by extension in the United Kingdom, both points being bracketed by the death of a long serving and much beloved Queen. During the reign of Queen Victoria, the office and role of the Lord Lion, the Lord Lion Court and the Lion Office were much reformed by statute and by practice. But the officers of arms who flanked the Lion King on the Market Cross in 1901 were still attired in uniforms broadly designed for the coronation of George IV in 1821. In September 2022, although Lion and his officers were attired in recently tailored uniform, they all followed the pattern of household dress laid down by King Edward VII. Thus, we might observe a reverse of the aphorism of Don Fabrizio, the Prince of Salina in The Leopard. If we want things to change, things will have to stay as they are. I'm also conscious that a review of 120 years of state ceremonial could fill an entire semester of lectures. So I've pruned hard and may have left out bits that some on this call this evening think should have been included. I've decided that in this talk, we'll cover the reigns of Edward VII and George V. And in a second part next year, we can review those of George VI and the late Queen Elizabeth. Some of the questions we might ask this evening include, why is it that the shape and ritual of our state ceremonial in Scotland and in London takes the form that it does? How has it evolved? How has the scope of participation of Scotland's representatives in that ceremonial changed? And what exactly is worn under a herald's tabard? In his biography of General Charles Chinese Gordon, General William Butler wrote, it is the victor who writes the history and counts the dead. Or in the case of this paper, it's this author who's read the voluminous correspondence in the Lion Office who writes the history. And I should say these are just my views. If you think that I've missed a point or drawn an incorrect conclusion, well, I have others. To begin at the beginning, we have to go back another century to 1820 and the accession of King George IV, another monarch who served a long apprenticeship, latterly as Prince Regent. At the time of the death of his father, George III, the Lion Office was in a state of atrophy under the nominal control of the 11th Earl of Canoe, who'd succeeded his father, the 10th Earl as Lion, in 1804. The Lion Office was run by his deputy, George Tate. Those of you who know your Dickens, and in particular to Little Dorrit, will be familiar with his caricature of government offices in the mid-19th century, portrayed by the Circumlocution Office. The Circumlocution Office was, as everybody knows without being told, the most important department under government. This glorious establishment had been early in the field when the one sublime principle involving the difficult art of governing a country was first distinctly revealed to statesmen. It had been foremost to study that bright revelation and to carry its shining influence through the whole of the official proceedings. 
whatever was required to be done, the circumlocution office was beforehand with all the public departments in the art of perceiving how not to do it. This notion of government by inaction or masterful inactivity is one that runs through 19th century British constitutional history and echoes can still be heard in the doctrine of unripe time, perhaps the subject for another paper at another time. But back to 1820, the Lord Lyon, Thomas, 11th Earl of Canoul, had succeeded his father in office in 1804 and, having poured himself into his trousers, would remain as lion for 62 years until his death in 1866. In July 1820, seven months after the accession of George IV, papers arrived at the lion office from London, outlining the plans for the coronation to be held the following summer. Here we meet the first planning question for state ceremonial in Scotland. What do you do if lion is not in the country? On 21st July, Lord Canoole's factor wrote to George Tate, returning the bundle of papers. His lordship was not in the country. The last letter I had from his lordship was one from Gothenburg on the 5th of June, requesting me to address him until further orders at the post office in Stockholm. He mentioned that it was not his intention to return to Great Britain during the ensuing winter. You might think that this was a uniquely 19th century problem and that today modern communications would render it impossible for Lyon to be away at a vital moment. In 2019, Lyon Morrow asked me to ensure that we coordinated our diaries to cover such an eventuality. As it happened, in September 2022, the train bringing him back from the Accession Council in London broke down, leaving me to muddle through the rehearsals for the Accession Proclamation in Edinburgh as best I could, supported, I should say, by the officers of arms who did much better than I did. Thankfully, Police Scotland later delivered Lyon safely to Edinburgh, otherwise he might have reinstated the proclamation at Berwick-upon-Tweed, which was treated as a separate jurisdiction within the United Kingdom until the late 19th century. Having asked you to step into my time machine, I'm now inviting you to step back inside and to travel further back to 1633. In June that year, Charles I arrived in Edinburgh for his Scottish coronation, some seven years after his English one. He was clearly determined to overawe his Scottish subjects. Largesse was the order of the day. Copious amounts of royal bling were brought up from London, including the golden dinner service of King Henry VIII. In one week at Holyrood, the king created six new earls, fated by lot and by precedence to sit next to each other at coronations in perpetuity. The royal party embarked on a progress from Edinburgh, taking in Linlithgow, Stirling, the king's birthplace at Dunfermline, and Falkland. The royal entourage and its vast baggage train then made for Kinghorn, where they embarked for Leith. Somewhere not far offshore, the barge carrying much of the royal baggage, including the golden dinner service, foundered and ended up at the bottom of the River Forth. The king would have been forgiven for taking it as an ill omen. But we must put down the lost golden teaspoons and observe the order of procession for the King's state entry into Edinburgh. If you strip out some of the offices and positions that no longer exist, although were I lion for a day, I would definitely reinstate the King's servant of the best sort and the master of requests. You will find strong echoes in the form and order for the royal procession into St Giles this past summer. But look again at the list. There's York Herald, a Noroi King of Arms, separated by six Heralds of Scotland. To my knowledge, the only appearance of English officers of arms in Scottish ceremonial since the Union of the Crowns. Lyon had attended the London coronations of James I and Charles I, but this is the one and only appearance of members of the College of Arms until the attendance, albeit not in uniform, of Garter and Blue Mantle participant at this July's service of Thanksgiving. This reciprocity of heraldic attendance wasn't repeated, albeit it would have been very unlikely for any English officers of arms to attend the Scottish coronation at Schoon of Charles II, and none of his successors were crowned in Scotland until the kingdoms of England and Scotland were dissolved by union in 1707. But 
the precedent was prayed in aid by a subsequent lion to justify his attendance at coronations in the new kingdom of Great Britain. Sometime before the coronation of King George I, the first of this new kingdom, the then lion, Sir Alexander Erskine of Cambo, wrote a memorandum which set out the grounds on which lions should be summoned to attend the event, not as a spectator, but as a participant. He showed both that previous lions had since 1603 attended the coronations of the monarch as King of England, and in 1633, likewise at the coronation of King Charles in Scotland, a king and herald of the then Kingdom of England were allowed the same rights in Scotland. Erskine carefully narrated the hope and expectation that now there being only one coronation for the Kingdom of Great Britain, that the King of Arms of Scotland will be allowed the same right to execute his office thereat as any King of Arms by an English title. And as to his role, that before the union of the kingdoms, Lion King of Arms was placed in England next after Garter and before the provincial kings, as his office is likewise of a much ancienter institution than either of their provincial kings. So there. He got his wish and Lyon was present at the coronation of the first three of the Georges, as were most of the Scottish great officers of state and household who took part in the coronation processions, along with the peers of Scotland who were summoned to attend. But <clears throat> it is the coronation of the fourth George that deserves a closer look as it casts its sizable regal shadow over state ceremonial to this day. George IV's coronation is the first properly British state event. His Hanoverian predecessors had looked nervously over their shoulders to Rome, where sat a rival dynasty. The death of Cardinal Henry of York in 1807 removed that last shadow. Ireland had joined Great Britain in 1801 to form a United Kingdom, and the effort to defeat Napoleon had drawn servicemen and resources from across the new kingdom. It seemed entirely appropriate that the first ever national British war memorial to mark the fallen of the long wars against the French should be built in Edinburgh atop Calton Hill, and equally appropriate that like Scottish infrastructure projects before and since, it was never finished. It was George IV's coronation that first fully involved officers of state and church from all three kingdoms. The coronation motifs intertwined roses, thistles and shamrocks. The flags of the kingdoms of the Union and the kingdom of Hanover were included in the procession. Knights of the Thistle and St Patrick walked alongside Knights of the Bath and the Garter. But we must, but, um, sorry, turned the wrong page, uh, but some elements have never been repeated. It was the last coronation to have a post-event banquet into which rode the King's champion. Several participants have never been seen again although there was a rumour that the herb strewers might have reappeared this year. And it was the only coronation where bouncers were hired to keep the Queen out of Westminster Abbey. But for Scotland's heralds, it was a red letter day. It marked the first time they'd been invited to attend and to participate. Despite, or perhaps because of, the absence of Lyon in Gothenburg, they took matters into their own hands and convened a meeting of the officers of arms. A roll was called and names of those intending to attend the coronation were taken. Of the heralds, Marchmont, Isla and Ross all responded in the affirmative and Albany expressed his apologies due to age and infirmity. From Rothsey, there was no response. Of the Perseverance, Unicorn, Ormond and Butte all put their hands up and Dingwall asked if he might send the deputy. A clean list was drawn up and sent to London from the Scotch College of Arms. Added to the names was that of Snowden Herald, who was resident in London. First item on the agenda, new kit. In February 1821, the King's jewellers, Rundle, Bridge and Rundle, write to ask for guidance on the arms of the Heralds of Scotland doubtless to enable the creation of the neck badges, still worn by the officers of arms today, and possibly the baton and crown of the Lord Lion. On 23rd June, less than a month from the coronation, George Naylor, Clarenceau King of Arms and later Garter, 
wrote to the Lion Clark, intimating that the collars and tabards for all the heralds, including the Scots, were ready and asking for confirmation of the officers attending. He then indicates that the king has approved the underdress to be worn and that his officers have given directions to Mr. Mayor, presumably the ancestor of today's well-known Mayor and Mortimer, bespoke tailors of London W1. In Charles Barnett's history of the Scottish officers of arms, there's a wonderful watercolour of my predecessor, Thomas Small, Marchmont Herald and Lion Depute, kitted out in all his coronation uniform. You can make out the English style crown on the table, a kind of barley sugar baton and the familiar neck badge of St Andrew. On the day itself, the King was led into procession from Westminster Hall to Westminster Abbey. I recently found an illustrated panorama of the occasion at auction, and you can see by comparison with the extract from the London Gazette of the day, which I've included, that it's quite accurate. In this snapshot, you can see the Registrar of the Order of the Garter and a Knight of the Garter, several members of the Royal Household. You can make out the Treasurer of the Household with his little bag of coronation medals, ready to scatter them to the crowd after the service. And then, intriguingly, for heraldic precedence, comes Blue Mantle Percivant of England, Isla Herald of Scotland, and Cork Herald of Ireland, with the Earl of Mayo carrying the standard of the Kingdom of Hanover. Blue Mantle's carrying his hat, but Isla and Cork hold their batons, clearly having left their bicorns back in Westminster Hall. And then another first, and not since repeated, both Garter and Lyon were represented by their deputies, Clarenceau and Marchmont, who we see here preceded by the two Scottish officers, Green and White Rod. On Marchmont's right is the Lord Mayor of London, who rather indignantly having to carry his own mace, and to Clarenceau's left is Black Rod. This extraordinary spectacle cost an absolute fortune. While George III's coronation came in at a modest 9,000 £430, that of George IV was a whopping 238000 or 21 million in today's terms. That said, although it's an outlier in the 19th century, 21 million broadly equates to the cost of the coronations of George VI and Elizabeth II. £100,000 was provided by the government and the rest came from French war indemnities making George IV's coronation the first since that of Henry VI of England and France to be partly paid for by the French. Expenses became an issue quite quickly for the Scottish officers. On August the 2nd, Lord Canoole, now back in Scotland, wrote to his deputy to say he'd learnt that Ross Herald had sent a deputy to attend the coronation on his behalf. Who was he and by what authority had he appeared? It becomes quickly apparent from the correspondence between now, between Lyon, now back at home, and his deputy in Edinburgh, that the sum sought in expenses by the officers who attended the coronation considerably exceeded the £254, or 23000 in today's money, advanced by the Treasury to Lord Canoole. The scale and expense of George IV's lavish enthronement was never repeated. In 1831, William IV tried not to have a coronation at all, but instead had a much reduced service, which bears comparison to that of Charles III. Gone was the procession from Westminster Hall and the post-event banquet. Out went the hereditary butlers, caterers and larderers. In came a carriage procession from St James's to the Abbey, which ironically meant that many more people got to see the king progress to and from his coronation. But on 20th July 1831, some days after the Scottish officers of arms had once again gathered in Edinburgh to see who was up for travelling to London, a letter from Sir George Naylor, now Garter, arrived at Lord Canoole's home at Duplin Castle, bearing bad news. There not being a procession at the approaching coronation, the attendance of the kings of arms and the heralds and precedents of Scotland and Ireland will not repeat, not be required. That was the end of Scottish heraldic participation. Lord Canoole didn't even attend as a peer, and no invitations came for the coronation of Queen Victoria either. It wasn't a complete removal of Scottish and Irish participation. The great officers of state still took part in both William and Victoria's 
processions with the Captain General of the Royal Company of Archers riding immediately behind Queen Victoria's carriage. In the Abbey procession, the Duke of Argyll as Lord Steward of the Household was joined by the Earl of Errol as High Constable of Scotland and by the Duke of Hamilton as Lord High Steward. The Queen, already weighed down by her coronation robes, wore the collars of all four of her orders of chivalry, the Garter, the Thistle, the Bath and St Patrick. For a student of ceremonial, Victoria's coronation presents an interesting evolution in form that reflected her minister's recognition that they had an opportunity to present the young sovereign to her people, many of whom had the vote for the first time. The procession was lengthened and it started and began at Buckingham Palace, now the centre of domestic and imperial pageantry for the foreseeable future. That brings us to the second aspect of state ceremonial, the presentation of the sovereign to his or her people by way of a coronation procession, or in Scotland, by way of state entry to their majesty's capital city. I know you're asking, when's he going to get to Edward VII? Soon, I assure you. But first, let us return to George IV. There's clearly not the time to launch into an analysis of the extraordinary visit of that monarch to Edinburgh, in 1822. Whether it was devised by Sir Walter Scott and supported by the King's ministers to acknowledge Scotland's place in the new United Kingdom, or simply a ruse to prevent the King from attending the Congress of Verona, doesn't really matter this evening. What matters is that we can extract from it several elements of royal ceremonial that predated the visit, were revived by it, and have survived to this day. The binding element is the visibility of the sovereign, and for the first time, the honours of Scotland to their people. That theme influenced Innes of Learning's planning for the service of Thanksgiving in 1953 and was a central part in the design of this year's Thanksgiving service as well. George IV's visit contained several elements, sadly not all repeated in subsequent visits. I'm sure the Lord Provost would like to give the monarch a banquet in Parliament Hall and be knighted on the spot. And it would be churlish to suggest that the household revived the levee and drawing room, where over two afternoons, the king shook hands with 1,500 Scotsmen and the next day took a peck on the cheek from 1,500 of their wives, mothers and daughters. But the form of royal procession, the ceremony of the keys and the taking possession of Edinburgh Castle remain essentially unchanged. One of the best and most amusing of the contemporary accounts of George IV's visit to Edinburgh is that of the anonymous author styled a Londoner, but no Cockney. I imagine a sort of early 19th century Robert Hardman. Initially weary and cynical, he's won over by the spectacles laid on over the course of Royal Week. In the initial procession from Leith to Holyrood House, he makes out Lyon, curveting and caracoling his handsome horse in front of a cloud of heralds and would have been irresistible in the eye of a dame of the 12th century. No change there then. Our correspondent is not wholly without wit, as later in the week he writes, I like the Scotch, their manliness, temperance, clean clothes and incapability of a jest. But more than all, I like their caution. I find a hundred instances of their reverence for the maxim of the Glasgow Bailey, never to thrust your arm out further than you can draw it in again. Of the King's final procession from Holyrood House to take possession of the castle, he observes, heralds, squires and chieftains, the hereditary officers of the throne, bearing badges and batons, followed in glittering procession with intervening guards of Highlanders and cavalry. And he spots a by now familiar sight. Some anonymous novelist to come will tell us of the crimson coat that flowed down to the golden spurs of my Lord Lion, the green velvet tunic gold embroidered, the enameled staff flowered with golden thistles and the Arabian caparisoned with gold that he caracoled and caprioled with such knightly dexterity. Here we can clearly observe the essential elements of royal processions before and since. The use of the royal mile as the processional route, the ordering of the participants and the essential truth that the sovereign and the dignified machinery of state, to paraphrase Badgett, must be seen and heard in all their majesty. The crowds lining the route in 1822 or 2023 would have seen and heard similar sights and sounds. Here is 
continuity, the co-location of past, present and future and the continuation of the national story. We'll take our leave of George IV as he appears on the half moon battery of Edinburgh Castle, where according to the correspondent, the moment of his appearance was sublime. He was hailed with a general shout and a clangor of drum and trumpet, a grand universal uproar. As you can see, the sketch of his appearance shows him waving a hat, which seems to be the same size of him, to accept the acclaim of his people. Let us now return to where we began, the proclamation of the accession of Edward VII. For the lawyers among us, it's worth remembering that the ceremonial events of 1901 and 1902 gave rise to several court cases. In Scotland, there was an unseemly tussle in the procession for the accession proclamation between the members of the Royal College of Surgeons and the Royal College of Physicians, which was finally disposed of by the Inner House in 1911, who ruled that it was outside the ministerial jurisdiction of the Lord Lyon to change their relative precedency. And then the King's untimely appendicitis, which put back the coronation from 9th June 1902 to 26th August, and led to a series of cases which helped update the law of frustration of contract in England. Although Edward VII's coronation was planned to be both an imperial and European event, the King's illness meant that most of the royal and state guests went home, which made the event probably the most British since that of George IV. There were other similarities. Both took place after the death of a long-serving monarch. Both occurred in the shadow of war, which left a profound mark across the British Isles. It was only, after all, just over a year, not much more than just over a year, since the Highland Brigade had been decimated at the Battle of Maersfontein in South Africa's Northern Cape, losing over 700 men in one day, 300 from the 2nd Battalion of the Scott Black Watch alone. And political reform lurked in the back and foreground. In 1821, it was Catholic emancipation and suffrage reform. And in 1901, it was home rule and tariff reform. Both George IV and Edward VII wanted a show. And Edward VII had a showman, in fact, two showmen to deliver it, Lord Isha and Sir Arthur Ellis. As secretary to the Ministry of Works, Isha had delivered the pageantry of the late Queen's Jubilee, and as a former query and now controller of the Lord Chamberlain's department, Ellis knew the King's mind and knew how to deliver it. Neither wanted the heralds anywhere near the organisation. In his book on coronation, Sir Roy Strong records Ellis's view that the members of the College of Arms were ghastly cads with not a gentleman among them. Strong doesn't record the collective view of the College of Sir Arthur. The King made it clear that he wanted the Scottish and Irish kings and heralds to attend, breaking open the English monopoly on the last two coronation services. But he also wanted them looking the part. This was the coronation of the idealised herald. Here, the illustrated London news shows what the King had in mind. Long limbed, calf toned and wax moustachioed demigods. This was a monarch who played, paid close attention to the uniformity of uniforms and to the correct dress for every occasion. It was Edward VII who upbraided Lord Harris for wearing a brown bowler hat at Royal Ascot. Go in ratin, Harris, and who, according to the two new podcast gods of the rest as history fame, Tom Holland and Dominic Sandbrook, sparked the First World War by laughing at his nephew the Kaiser for wearing the wrong shoes when he came aboard the royal yacht at Cowes. So it was that the Scottish and Irish officers of arms were provided with new kit, red coatees, tabards with English quarterings, and the new style Tudor bonnet. But there was pushback. In 1901, Scotland and Ireland each had strong-willed kings of arms. In Edinburgh, the 55-year-old Sir James Balfour Paul had been lion for 11 years, and in the words of Charles Burnett, had reinvigorated the office of lion. In Dublin, the 37-year-old Ulster King of Arms was the mercurial Arthur Vickers, who'd been appointed Ulster at 29 after writing to both the Chief Secretary to Ireland and the Lord Lieutenant, effectively claiming that the other one wanted him to be appointed. Vickers led with his chin, and his rhinoceros hide and sheer chutzpah were to bring golden plaudits in the short term, but ultimately disgrace and death. 
Balfour Paul ensured that petitions for Lyon and the Scottish officers to attend and to participate in the coronation were lodged with the Court of Claims, despite the advice of Richmond Herald that it would not be necessary, which advice was to become a source of discontent in the months ahead. Both Lyon and Ulster were keen that their heraldic delegations do more than simply attend. At one point, Ulster lobbied Arthur Ellis and the King's uncle, the Duke of Connaught, to be allowed to take part in the mounted procession from Buckingham Palace. This, he wrote to Lyon, would distinguish the Scottish and Irish kings of arms who could both ride, unlike their English counterparts. His request was declined. The Court of Claims approved the petitions of Lyon and Ulster, but left the decision on what they were to do to the Earl Marshal. Initially, the Duke of Norfolk suggested the Scottish and Irish officers of arms might take part in the indoors procession, but then move to the North Isle out of sight of the main event. On 29th March 1902, Ulster wrote to Lyon in advance of the Earl Marshal's decision, fearing that he would decline our services and that he'd been influenced by Garter, Somerset, York and Richmond heralds. The rest, I think, he writes, are friendly. At this moment, a Scottish spanner was inserted in the works. The Earl Marshal wrote to Lyon intimating he'd received a memorandum from Lord Balfour of Burley, the Secretary for Scotland, indicating that Lyon and his officers should merely attend but not participate in the coronation, the implication being there would be a separate coronation event in Edinburgh. There isn't sadly a copy of this note in the Lyon office files, and I haven't yet found another one. Lord Burley was a unionist, but to paraphrase David Torrance, he was a leading nationalist unionist and may have had it in mind that a Scottish coronation event might have helped diminish support for home rule and with it the relative electoral prospects of the Scottish Liberal Party. In this thinking, he was followed a century later by his successor in office, Michael Forsyth, who saw the return of the Stone of Destiny from Westminster to Edinburgh in the same light. Both initiatives failed in their political aims if they had any political impact at all. But this put Lyon on the back foot, and on the 5th of April, the Earl Marshal issued his decision. Lyon and Ulster were to take part in the procession, but not to have any additional duties in connection with the coronation ceremony. Lyon hit back, politely. In a draft note to the Duke of Norfolk, he declines to accept both Norfolk and Burley's arguments the coronation is an essentially English affair. Although I am not a fervid patriot, he wrote, I think it is an imperial ceremony which should be taken part in by as many official representatives of the empire as possible. And not just Lyon. His officers should attend in their official capacity and their places in the Abbey should be regulated by precedent, as in, do what they did in 1821. And in a dig at the inefficiency of the Earl Marshal's department, Lyon offered to place our services and those of any members of our staff at your grace's disposal in the organisation of the coronation, knowing full well, I expect, that those services would be declined and that the organisation was really taking place in the offices of Lord Isha and Sir Arthur Ellis. On 11th April, Ulster again wrote to Lyon, having clearly also received a copy of the Earl Marshal's note. I regret to say that Garter is against us. I mean to go and see him tomorrow and thrash the matter out with him. Essentially, the Irish and the Scots wanted to process into the Abbey and then stand in the theatre along with the English officers to witness the coronation. Vickers continued, I heard at the Lord Chamberlain's department the King has determined the heralds of all three countries shall be treated alike and we have, need have no fear on this score. And then the killer blow. Having been advised by Richmond Herald, it was not necessary for the Irish and Scots heraldic establishments to petition the Court of Claims. Vickers had called in on the court administration to collect some papers to be told that Richmond Herald was the man to try and squash our claims, the scoundrel. And he it was who said to me afterwards that we need not have petitioned. I should add at this point, as a matter of fraternal courtesy, that the current Richmond Herald is a very good friend, and it has been and remains an absolute pleasure to work with him, whether on the rain-soaked Diamond Jubilee barge, at last year's state funeral, or in the heraldic rotations of this summer's coronation. No herald can be held responsible for the sins of his or her predecessor. Through their pre-coronation correspondence, Ulster and Lyon clearly struck up a friendship. Vickers recommended a Welsh boarding house run by the Mrs. Patchell to the Pools as a lovely place to go on holiday, 
And on 14th April, Ulster wrote to Lyon, who's now staying, along with Lady Paul, at Sea View, Flanfair Fechen, North Wales, with good news. Since I wrote to you on Friday, I went to see Garter on Saturday and had a most pleasant interview with him. The then Garter, Sir Albert Woods, was 85 years old and long past his prime. He'd been an officer of arms at Queen Victoria's coronation. What he made of the young Arthur Vickers is not recorded, but Ulster wrote to Lyon that Garter agreed that the Irish and Scottish heraldic contingent should stand with their English brethren in the Sacrarium, and that Lyon and Ulster should be accorded the same rights and privileges as in 1821. The point he contended against was our taking any part in the marshalling of the procession, wrote Vickers. I said that we'd be willing to assist, but were perfectly content to leave it to be bungled by the heralds. The close working between Lyon and Ulster saw them collaborate over the commissioning of new regalia and tabards. Ulster writes to Lyon that he's commissioned his new crown from Garrards, even before a decision has been made on who'll pay for it. He recommends the services of Messrs Hills, Taylors in London for the tabards, and asks Lyon if he can borrow his collar of S's to be copied by West, the court jewellers in Dublin. As you can see from this illustration from Peter Galloway's magisterial book on the Order of St. Patrick, what Sir Arthur commissioned was very fine indeed, even if the Lord Chamberlain's office ultimately <laughs> refused to pay for it. On 25th April, Ulster wrote to Lyon, who's moved from Wales through London and back to Edinburgh, I'm most anxious to know what you did at the Earl Marshal's office in connection with matters common to our interests. On the 29th April, Mr Hamilton of the Treasury writes to the Scottish office to indicate it can pay for new uniforms, tabards, and other articles as needed by the Scottish officers of arms, but they are to remain public property. This in response to a letter on the 9th of April from the Under Secretary of State, pointing out the Scottish officers were still wearing the tabards made for the coronation of George IV. This is almost the last letter on file in the Lion office on Edward VII's coronation. All the Scottish and Irish officers attended, which because more rehearsals had been held due to its postponement, was in the words of Lord Isha, one of the utmost order and dignity, even though both the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Dean of Westminster were old and unwell and thought unlikely to get through the service. As it was, the partially sighted Archbishop placed the crown the wrong way round on the King's head and when he knelt to pray, had to be lifted back up onto his feet. But after the party, comes the hangover. On 23rd October, Mr Hamilton, he of the Treasury, writes to the Under Secretary of State for Scotland with some queries on Lyon and his officer's expenses. Taking first the expenses of the Lion King himself, a claim is made for subsistence allowance for eight days in June and another eight days in August. On both occasions, Lyon had stayed on for two whole days after the scheduled date of the coronation. It is not apparent, writes Mr Hamilton, why he, Lyon, had to stay on at the public expense in London. It is also to be observed that the allowance claimed in June is at the exceptional rate of 25 shillings a night. But my lords note that the other Scotch officers of arms appear to have found the ordinary allowance of one pound and one shilling sufficient. It should be noted that 25 shillings in 1901 equates to roughly 180 pounds today. And then Mr Hamilton continues, with regard to the claims of the other officers of arms, my lords would be glad to learn on what principle their attendance was fixed, as Rothsey found it necessary to be in attendance for seven days in June and for ten in August, while Unicorn claims for eight and five. But there is sadly no reply in the Lion Office files. Lyon and the Scottish officers returned to London in 1911 for the coronation of King George V. The form and order of the event was broadly similar to that of Edward VII, but was even grander, with a huge turnout, the last ever, of members of European and global royal families, many of whom were the King's cousins. But there was to be no repeat of the Lyon and Ulster show. In late June 1907, a few days before the arrival in Dublin of the King and the Queen, someone broke into a safe in Dublin Castle and removed the collar and insignia of the Grand Master of the Order of St. Patrick and five other knightly collars. The theft of what became known as the Irish Crown Jewels caused a political and social firestorm. The King was outraged and demanded that the now Sir Arthur Vickers resign. Vickers dug in and appealed for an inquiry. 
But having not exactly endeared himself to the powers that be in the run-up to the coronation, he found himself without friends when he needed them. He didn't go down without a fight. He organised a petition from all but one of the Knights of St. Patrick, appealing to the King for an inquiry that would identify the thief. His brother-in-law, who was a prominent Irish nationalist, organised for the issue to be raised in Parliament, and probably did vicars more harm than good. And finally, a commission of inquiry was convened and published its report on the 25th of January 1908. It found that Sir Arthur had not exercised due vigilance or proper care as the custodian of the regalia. And on the 30th of January, he was sacked. In a tragic final act during the bitter but brief Irish War of Independence, his home, Kilmorna House in County Kerry, was surrounded by a group of armed men on the 14th of April, 1921. The house was set alight and he was taken out into his garden and shot dead. The IRA subsequently issued a statement denying responsibility. Scotland had to wait nine months before Edward VII and Queen Alexandra paid their first official visit. In May 1903, the royal party arrived in Edinburgh and travelled in semi-state from Holyrood via Abbey Mount, Regent Road, Princess Street and the Mound to the castle, where Lyon and his officers demanded it be opened in the name of the king. The royal party ascended to Crown Square, but there was no repeat of George IV's appearance on the Half Moon Battery. Instead, a more modern walkabout ensued with the King and Queen viewing the honours of Scotland before inspecting a parade of military veterans, some of whom had served in the Crimean War. The outline of all future royal visits can be seen in King Edward's two-day programme, an inspection of the Royal Company of Archers, a visit to a hospital and to a school, the holding of a levee today replaced by an investiture, and a visit to Glasgow. Half a mile from where I am sitting this evening stands a statue to Edward VII, the peacemaker, wearing his mantle and insignia of the thistle, erected after his death in Victoria Park in New Haven here in Edinburgh by the town council of Leith. The council approved the statue after the affirmative decision of a public meeting convened by the provost one week, one week after King Edward died. Peace across the UK and Europe and stable trade across the world were precious commodities to the merchants of Leith. And King Edward's diplomatic initiatives as monarch to calm tensions with and within Ireland and within Europe resonated with the citizens of this trading port. A brief look at his itinerary for 1903, the year of his formal visit to Scotland, shows how active he was. Many years before air travel, he visited Portugal, Gibraltar and Malta before taking in Naples, Rome and the Vatican, the first visit to the Pope by a reigning monarch. Then came a state visit to Paris and following his visit to Edinburgh, he was back in Dublin. And then in September came the annual visit to Marienbad and a state visit to Vienna. The next year included a return to Ireland and a visit to Germany. You'll note the visits to Ireland. Home rule was firmly back on the agenda and was to dominate the country's politics into the first years of the reign of George V. Home rule all round was the mantra of the ruling Liberal government, and that included, included Scotland. This in turn added a ceremonial coda to the involvement of Scotland's heraldic establishment in the reign of King Edward. Shortly after the King's death, George Swinton, March Persevant, wrote to Lion Balfour Paul from London, intimating he had met Lord Pentland, the now Liberal Secretary for Scotland, who was quite alive to our right and is communicating with the Earl Marshal. Swinton was no political neophyte, becoming chairman of London County Council in 1912. His mother was a Sitwell, making him first cousin once removed of Osbert, Sir Chaverell and Edith and he was great-grandfather of the actress Tilda Swinton. What was the right that Swinton and Pentland sought to enforce? It was for the Scottish officers of arms to attend the funeral of King Edward at Windsor. The Earl Marshal's position was there was insufficient space in St George's Chapel. Lord Pentland's response, <coughs> excuse me, Lord Pentland's response was that in that case, English perseverance should give way to Scottish heralds. The next day, Swinton called on Garter, now Alfred Scott Gatty, Albert Woods having died in 1904, who told him the matter was settled. The king was being buried as a knight of the Garter, and attendance would be limited to officers, officers of that order. Separate funeral-related events were to be held in Ireland and Scotland. Swinton wrote, 
I told him the latter was no argument, as Ireland had a viceroy, while Scotland had only a king, and it was our business to see him buried. Carter demurred, and Swinton called on the Earl Marshal, who repeated much the same, and he drew a distinction between the coronation and the funeral, and presumed we'd have a service in Edinburgh. The Earl Marshal added, twisting the knife, that although Lyon had been invited to attend the funeral in Westminster, he might prefer to remain in Edinburgh. Swinton continued, half an hour later I again met Garter in the street and was told that none of the great officers of Scotland were being asked, not even the High Constable Lord Errol. I said there would be trouble and we parted. Sadly, that was that. Lyon attended, participating in the procession into St George's Chapel, walking beside Ulster and ahead of Blackrod and Garter. I should perhaps add a footnote at this point, more of a Christmas thought experiment, really. In 1943, six years after the Irish Free State was abolished with the adoption of Ireland's 1937 constitution, the office of Ulster King of Arms was merged with that of Norroy and is now enjoyed by my cousin, the wonderful Robert Noel. Without wishing to deprive Robert of his living, I merely wonder aloud why Ulster King of Arms should be permanently attached to the English heraldic executive. Is there not an argument in these devolved times for the office to sit more comfortably in Edinburgh? Should Scotland not have two kings of arms? We can take turn and turn about, like the Chumleys and the Carringtons do with the office of Lord Chamberlain. Just a thought. In the interest of time, I'll leave the evolution of the ceremonial surrounding the Order of the Thistle to my next talk. King George and Queen Mary made eight formal visits to Scotland, during their reign, becoming the first king and queen to use Holyrood House as a base for what becomes known to us all as Royal Week, which took on the shape recognisable today. On 19th July 1911, 2,000 people crammed into St Giles Cathedral for the opening by George V of Robert Lorimer's Thistle Chapel. Just over a week earlier, the king and queen were in Dublin, where George V presided over an investiture for the Order of St Patrick. While the opening of the Thistle Chapel heralded a new chapter for Scottish ceremonial, the installation in Dublin Castle was the last ever held. When George V left Dublin on 12th July, it was the last time a King of Ireland did so. But as one door closed in Dublin, another opened in Edinburgh. King George and Queen Mary introduced one further innovation, along with Scotland's Royal Week, the informal Royal Walkabout. 100 years ago, the King and Queen, accompanied by the Duke and Duchess of York, visited Dunfermline. Bowler hats and lounge suits were the order of the day, and the King and Queen shook hands down the length of Dunfermline's High Street. Then came lunch at Broom Hall. In this photograph, my aunts Martha and Jean sit in the front row, with Jean being stretched apart by the Queen Empress and the future Queen Empress. Out of sight, as he was still in utero, is my father, who was born the following February. Facing the lunch party under his protective black awning was the assistant to the town photographer. His boss, Mr Norville, was also the provost of Dunfermline and in the group. After some minutes with nothing happening, the provost called on his assistants to take the photograph. And from under the blanket came the muffled cry, if the wee man with the beard would stand still, I can take it. It's time for this wee man with the beard to wrap up. I hope this evening I've managed to show how Scotland's heraldic executive has helped direct and guide the evolution of state ceremonial both in Scotland and in London, as the kingdoms of England, Scotland, Great Britain and then the United Kingdom have themselves evolved. In my next talk, should there be one, we'll look at the reign of George V, the year of the three kings, and the long and steady development of ceremonial through the reigns of George VI and his daughter, the late Queen Elizabeth. Very much indeed. Well, thank you, Adam. That was wonderful. And it's, uh, it's absolutely a wonderful night uh, in terms of the information you've given. And I'm pretty sure everybody will be desperately waiting on the next next. Um, part of it so thank you very much it's hard to know but if we could actually if you've got a thing that allows you to clap clap if you haven't put your hands up and say thank you to adam it's amazing ladies and gentlemen the amount of um 
material we've got in the line office if you actually get in about it. So, uh, and there's an example um, of Adam getting into the correspondence and bringing alive uh, so many stories about the interrelationships, which are really the most interesting thing. Lots of comments. There's one gone up, Adam. That was tremendous. So there you go. I think we we're not going to get one better than that. And terrific has gone up on, this, on my screen. Great talk. Looking forward to the next part. So let's stop that and let's see if we can um, have a few questions. We've got a few moments. Uh, I'm very desperate to, to close at, um, at the back of eight so people get back to what they're going to do. Um, but I see the first question I've got is from the hand. The hand up is from somebody called. Oh, there it is Jock Miller. Jock, would you like to make your point and make your question? Unmute yourself and speak away. Pure dead brilliant, Adam. But but the Jock. Jock, you were the first hand up. Well, if you can't come in, you can come in later. Um, can we take the, uh, can we pick, take Alan Beck then? Alan, would you like to go ahead with your question? Thank I'm you. Here. Thank you, Lion. Uh, Adam, that was absolutely terrific. Can I just ask you, the picture of uh, George Swinton, he was wearing the uh, English quarterings of the, of the Royal Arms. When did the Scots officers at arms start using a Scottish quartering? Thank you. Uh, yes, um, they, the, the English quarterings were worn until relatively recently uh, in the 1920s. The Scottish quarterings um, uh, came into use. Um, somebody's going to correct me because I've completely forgotten, but it was as a result of a donation uh, by a biscuit magnet, I think, um, to the Lion Office, uh, which uh, enabled the, the um, commissioning of Scottish quartered tabards for the first time. Um, but uh, yes, uh, and you can also detect from that photograph, um, uh, from that illustration of George Swinton, uh, just which bits of him he passed on to his great granddaughter um, and, uh, by way of his legs, uh, which are eccentric <laughs> <laughs> by the wearing of, uh, of his coronation dress as well. Thank you. 1929 was the changeover. There we are. I knew you'd know, Lion. <laughs> well, I didn't know it. Kevin put it up on the screen. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody? Oh, there's Elizabeth. Elizabeth, put your thing up again because it said who gave the donation. It was a Glasgow lawyer. We always thought it was the biscuit man. All oh, right. It actually turned out that he was a lawyer in Glasgow. Great stuff. So that, that's good. That's good. Any any other questions? Comments. I've got we've got the comments. I'm running through this to see if there's any questions. Looking forward to part B. You've got a following here, Adam. <laughs> Two minutes more. If there's no questions, I'll wind up. Um, and I've I know one comment. Uh, sorry, I know, um, Russell, just before you come in, I know, Lion, why there are no, uh, not very many questions this evening. It's the College of Arms Christmas supper, <laughs> Christmas party tonight. So we've none of our English colleagues are on the call, which might mean that might be a result of why we haven't had quite so many questions. It might have kept, that might, might keep relations a wee bit better <laughs> as well. They'd, what about, they'd be too Russell? frightened, Adam. They'd be too <laughs> frightened. Uh, Russell, you wanted to make a comment? I just wanted to say the um, the letter um, questioning very severely the reason for expenses. I think there is a reply I've seen in the office. I've seen I've seen that letter, and I think there is a reply. Do, do you mean to say, Russell, there's a secret line Clark archive that I haven't been able? No, to there's. <laughs> well, unless Elizabeth knows about it, no, I don't have a secret line Clark archive. But I'm certain <laughs> I've seen that letter, so I'll have a look in the folder when I'm next in the Thank office. You. It might have been tucked away somewhere, but I have a strange feeling I have. I've seen that letter, and I'm sure I've got the back of the mind. I have seen a response to it. What's really interesting is how in the 1821 coronation, I mean, obviously, uh, with communications in terms of travel from Edinburgh to London being so much, taking so much time, that it was sort of expected that you could appoint a deputy, 
um and and then you know the but without telling lion which was it ross or rothsey who appointed a deputy without telling Lyon. so this man just turned up claimed his expenses and and you know and i presume that lion probably had to cover the difference between the monies advanced by the lords commissioners of the treasury and the actual sums claimed by the officers of arms well last time for asking any other comments or questions before i sum up right that's us all done. Can I say thank you, Adam, again? That was wonderful. And, and, I'm, and I'm sure that those uh, who want to listen to it again can go on to the YouTube and, and, and wind up on that. Also, um, we're looking forward to your second part. We'll try to do that very early on in the new year uh, so that people can keep the continuity through. Um, it was absolutely fascinating um, just to see that perspective that's brought us to today. It's also fascinating, um, and I'm sure you'll get around to telling the stories where some of the issues still exist and, and they're still kicking around um, in terms of the, 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 the activity um, around all state ceremonial, but basically they're, they're all there and the principles that are brought through. So next year, first lecture will be um adam again and we'll try to get a a a a, 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 a man this is is this the monday night yeah monday night uh, it seems to be where a, pop, a popular night we've had good attendances on a monday and we'll have a series of events next year to take you through the trustees are meeting fairly soon um, um and i think when we've done that we'll have a bit more to tell you uh, in the next uh, in the next meeting about how the society is moving forward uh, and also um we'll have a an opportunity to get a newsletter out. Uh, might I suggest that that um, to Edward Mallison and, and and the team at the team at um, um, the Heraldry Society th that would be a good talk for the Heraldry Society to hear as well. I know we've done it online, but there's a different group of people, and I would willingly attend the next time that you you did it you did it again, and you might be able to bring it in together. We wish you well, um, Adam. We hope you get better. I hope we don't get whooping cough. That's something that's 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 pretty drastic. Well, if anybody on the call has diphtheria, I'm willing to get it to make the full royal flush of Victorian <laughs> diseases. <laughs> 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 uh, and uh, finally, uh, again, to record my thanks and to say to all of you a very a very happy Christmas or or festive season to you all, and and every best wishes for 2024. And I look forward to seeing you all um, in 2024, either online or in person. So good night, everybody, and take care of yourselves. And well done to Adam again. Hands together for Adam. <laughs>